Welcome to the High Rise Podcast, presented by Headset, the leading data and analytics company for the cannabis industry. Welcome back to the High Rise, a laid back data back conversation where we talk all things cannabis from US MSOs to Canadian LPs, products and market analysis through the lens of data. My name is Cy Scott with Headset. I am joined as always by Emily Paxia of Poseidon. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the High Rise. And cannabis and music uh, have always gone hand in hand. And today we're really excited to have a very special guest join us with Rick Farman, co-founder of Superfly and co-founder of a couple festivals you are probably very familiar with, such as Outside Lands and Bonnaroo. Thanks for joining us today, Rick. Thanks for having me. Really glad to be here with y'all. So why don't we start uh, for our listeners just uh, a little bit about your background and, and how you found yourself or the path uh, to founding Superfly? Yeah, so I uh, started my journey as a, a huge music fan. And music was the thing that in my uh, late teens and early 20s was really inspiring me and moving me as a human towards, you know, places that I wanted to, to take my life. I went to college at Tulane, so I was in New Orleans and really got immersed in the whole world of uh, culture and community uh, that exists there in a really profound way. And then I started working at clubs, doing, you know, odd jobs, the bartending, doorman, all that kind of stuff, and quickly kind of, you know, worked my way up into working in the promotion side and um, booking side, you know, in my college years. And in the, it, that time, um, had the opportunity to start with a couple friends of mine uh, producing some shows on our own. We'd kind of cut our teeth learning at the club level and um, had decided to try to be a little bit more entrepreneurial about it. And so we started putting on shows under the Superfly name during Mardi Gras and Jazz Fest time. They were kind of special events that were focused on, you know, what was going on during those big times of year. And that was really the beginning of Superfly. And from there, it was a regular concert promoter for a number of years, just doing, you know, shows at any venue and club around New Orleans that, you know, kind of made sense, uh, working with a lot of national artists and started to build a reputation, uh, particularly around unique programming, around, you know, putting different artists that normally wouldn't be on the same bill together or encouraging artists to create you know, different content with other artists. Um, we launched a, a series called Super Jam, which was essentially kind of a platform for people to come together to create one time only sort of all-star band concepts. And it was really successful for us, um, got us some national attention. And during that time, we were also really paying attention to the European festival market. We were inspired by a bunch of things that were happening domestically in the festival market and recognized that for what we were trying to do, the type of audience we were trying to program for and the community that we were, you know, kind of working within, that there was really a missing aspect of a more national festival opportunity. And so that uh, led to us creating Bonnaroo and Bonnaroo's, you know, kind of one of the real um, modern festival iconic brands that are out there. Um, Bonnaroo happens on a farm in Middle Tennessee on a 700 acre farm that we eventually acquired and built into, you know, really one of the more, you know, meaningful uh, festival experiences in America. You know, that was really what transformed our business from being kind of a small mom and pop operation in New Orleans that was really focused on that market to being something that was really more of a national you know, business with a, with, you know, kind of a reputation for, you know, doing these large scale experiences. We went on from there to create lots of different types of festivals, uh, comedy festivals, culinary festivals, city festivals, all sorts of different things. You know, the other one that we're probably most known for is, and will be relevant to our conversation today is the Outside Lands Music Festival that happens in San Francisco's Golden Gate Park and is coming up here in just a few weeks. We're really excited. This is, I believe, our 14th or 15th festival. So uh, we've been doing this for a long time as well. And uh, it's really you know, quite an amazing event that has a you know significant cannabis aspect to it. And so you know, at Superfly, we kind of have three things that we currently do. We create large-scale experiences. We also have a marketing business. So we do all the brand partnerships for all of our experiences uh, in-house, but from doing that work in-house with lots of different brand partners, we developed an expertise 
around, uh, you know, live experience strategy and execution around those kind of things. And so we work for all sorts of different brands, uh, many five Fortune 500 companies, helping them with their experience strategy, helping them figure out really creative ways to engage their communities around experiences and their customers. So that's the agency piece of the business, which is, is a pretty large piece of the business. And then most recently, we started a location-based part of the business where we license uh, film and TV and music brands and create these kind of immersive walkthrough experiences. So currently, we have a friend's experience based on a you know, friend's television show. We have an office experience based on the office television show. Uh, we have a Prince experience uh, that we just launched in Chicago. Um, and these things typically will spend anywhere from you know uh, three to six months in a particular location, and then they'll tour around. You know, move on to another location. So, you know, in essence, what Superfly does today is we either create our own experiences, we license IP and create experiences around that, or we help brands in a service capacity uh, use experience as part of their overall uh, strategy to engage with their consumers. So we're, you know, a, a pretty diversified experience company at this point. And, uh, you know, that's that's really what excites us is anything, any way we can use experience whether it's physical experience, whether it's a digital experience to connect with, you know, fans and, and build community around that. Yeah. Thank you for taking us through the arc of, of what you've built. I definitely, it's funny. I was in Chicago last week for a whirlwind trip and I saw the signs for the Prince experience and I'm definitely going to check it out when I, now I'm, I'm going to plan in advance and go check that out. Cause I, I'm a big fan of Prince. I feel like who's not. <laughs> it's pretty neat. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 a great way to kind of go deeper with an artist that you know you can't see live anymore, you know. And so what we really dig, you know, about those things is that we're able to really bring fans and kind of put them inside of the content. And uh, it, it's a it's a different experience for sure, and one that um, you know we we really uh, are enjoy bringing to people. Yeah. And um, being based in San Francisco, for me, it's an easy bike ride into Golden Gate Park to go to Outside Lands. And I've had the chance to go in for a couple of years now and and every single time have an amazing experience. And one of the things we've actually talked about on the podcast is that not only is there a music experience, but there's also wine lands and cheese lands. There's all these different kind of aspects to the festival that go in addition to the music. And whoever listens to the podcast has also heard me talk about grasslands. And so would love to hear your adventure into endeavoring into incorporating an official cannabis experience at a large scale music yeah. festival. So my interest and in, in sort of the opportunity around this starts with uh, as legalization was happening, you know, I was really thinking about the nexus between you know, what we do as experienced creators and cannabis. And as you said, obviously there's been a deep connection between cannabis and entertainment and music, you know, forever, basically. Um, And so, you know, as legalization was taking hold, I started to just as an entrepreneur, look around at that space and think about, you know, where there was opportunity for us as an experienced company and where there's opportunity for me, you know, as an executive and somebody who, you know, loves business and is just fascinated by new markets and things like that. And so I started investing in various cannabis companies just personally. Me and my partner, Rich, you know, have a little investment vehicle where we, you know, we invest in other businesses, particularly where we have some connection or relationship with entrepreneurs because we love entrepreneurialism and we love community around that. We love learning from other entrepreneurs and sharing what we've learned with other entrepreneurs. And so, um, and that's really how Emily and I first kind of started coming in contact as we had some mutual friends in the space that introduced us. And so, you know, I started to get you know, just awareness and visibility of, around how cannabis brands were marketing and how, how they're trying to connect with their communities and, you know, what they could do and what they couldn't do. And uh, as all that was taking hold, of course, you know, the Outside Lands partnership, which is, you know, Superfly and Another Planet, which is, you know, Another Planet are the kind of premier concert promoters in Northern California. They're our, our partner on Outside Lands. And we all started to kind of talk about, hey, you know, could we manifest some sort of cannabis experience at Outside Lands? So actually what we did first, right as legalization was happening, is we started to create an area that allowed cannabis brands 
to have a presence at Outside Lands. This was prior to us having any sort of sales or consumption, but it was just a way for us to sort of acknowledge, you know, this, you know, industry that was really, you know, becoming part of the Bay Area fabric too. And that's really the mission of Outside Lands is to, you know, be, be able to expose and, and express everything that Bay Area culture is about. And so as, as this was becoming something that was palatable and, you know, legal, we started to think about light ways to include cannabis brands, you know, in, into the event and started the Grasslands concept. And then the year after that, we had the great fortune of uh, being able to secure a license to do sales and, and consumption. And uh, as far as I know, at least, are are still the only, but certainly the the first real large scale, you know, festival, uh, a class festival that you know had a license to sell and consume. Uh, cannabis globally. I, I don't think it's really ever been done globally. And I've been to festivals all over the world. You know, it's been a huge passion of mine is really kind of learning about all the experiences that are out there that are, you know, either right in the pocket of festivals uh, or, or adjacent to. And, um, you know, one of my, I feel like, uh, you know, one of my claims to to fame now can be uh, that, you know, one of my festivals had the first ever you know, sales and consumption of cannabis, you know, globally, like that's a pretty cool thing. The 18 or 19 year old me would have uh, been pretty, uh, pretty happy and, and pretty surprised, frankly, at, at that being a reality and, and being something that was part of my career. So I, I, I feel uh, re- really lucky and also somebody who needs to, you know, kind of continue to be a steward in championing you know, the opportunity for cannabis brands and the cannabis industry to manifest at experiences, you know, like outside lands where clearly, you know, the influence of, you know, that industry and the product is, you know, substantive. And so it's been a great, great journey this year. I think we have maybe uh, 12 or 13 brands that are going to be a part of Grasslands this year. You know, a very, you know, really nice menu of stuff that we are able to sell there. And, you know, it's just a unique experience to be able to go to a festival, be able to, you know, check out what products are out there, what's new, what's happening, talk to some of the purveyors and the creators of those things, and then actually sample and, you know, try those things right in that environment of all the creativity, you know, that you're surrounded by with all of these other aspects, like Emily was talking about it, putting cannabis side by side with wine, with beer, with uh, food, with art, with music, like right where it should be, basically. Yeah. You know, being in the industry for a while now, sometimes I lose perspective. But when I was walking around grasslands last year, I got to hear people talking about it who you know, aren't in the industry. And they were like, this is so cool. I can't believe we're at a cannabis specific or weed specific event and a music festival. And it was, it was great to hear that because it just shows me we have so far to go. And and you're absolutely right. I think your younger self would be pretty proud to see that kind of a thing happening. Yeah, it's really cool. And I still pinch myself uh, that, that, you know, we're able to do it there. And again, able to sort of like bring all these creative people together, you know, the, the cannabis industry and the people who are around it are, are highly creative. That's part of the inspiration for, you know, getting involved. And so to be able to sort of, you know, facilitate that manifesting, you know, with all this other creative energy that we have at a festival is, is really special. Yeah. You mentioned, um, like brand experience. And and one of the things we've talked about a number of times on, on the show is just how challenging it can be for a brand to get exposure and to market itself to the consumer. And, uh, you know, cannabis has a lot of limitations around, you know, how you can, you can market where you can market, particularly in, in mainstream outlets, like places where, you know, other comparable products like, you know, alcohol, for example, you know, can, can be on TV all day. Right. But you would never see it. Uh, you'd never see cannabis, uh, in that same channel. Like how has the brand like feedback, you mentioned 12 to 13 brands as part of the festival. Are they, I would have to guess that they must love it, right. Getting, getting access to so many consumers to, to be able to not only, Tell the consumers, you know, what they're all about, but to hear, you know, what the consumers are thinking about their brands and kind of given your, your experience, even beyond, you know, cannabis, but certainly, you know, putting together these brand experiences for maybe more traditional brands. I mean, how much is this helping the cannabis operators that you work with? Yeah. 
Well, I'll tell you one thing that's kind of really interesting in, in relation to what you're bringing up here. Superfly is typically very, I'd say, specific and almost a little precious about how a brand manifests in our events. So we, one of the things we don't do, or a bunch of things we don't do, is we don't do stage sponsorships. We don't do presented buys. We don't do banners all over the place. Like we actually started with a very particular philosophy that we still carry through to this day, which is if a brand's gonna be at one of our events, the consumer has to feel like there's some benefit to them, right? It's not just a transaction, you pay us, to hit our consumers and the consumer gets advertised to. It's always about some sort of integrated offering where the fan can easily answer the question, what is this brand doing here that's elevating the event or creating a better experience for them or some value there, okay? So that's always where we start from. What I think has been fascinating with us with cannabis is that just the presence of the brands being there unto themselves is a value to the consumer, right? And I wouldn't say that about pretty much any other industry. You know, one of the things that helps us do that is because of the product and because of sort of the history and, you know, coming now into being a legalized offering to people. And and I think most consumers being really excited and happy about that and, and, you know, really wanting to embrace that. There's almost zero negative brand affinity for most cannabis companies. Like, you know, if you put, I don't know, Pepsi up there, maybe people can have some sort of opinion about whether Pepsi's, you know, negative or something. And I'm not saying it is, but like in times you could see how a consumer might, I don't want, you know, this insurance company or this bank or this whatever involved in my music festival. Like I have a negative perception of that. With cannabis, it just doesn't exist, right? I think everybody's excited when, you know, a tree's or, you know, one of the brands that we're working with manifest there, right? Like it's cool to learn about those brands. It's cool to engage with those brands. It's cool to feel like you have an opportunity to try one of those brands. And I, and I think just their mere presence, you know, unto itself is an experience that is valuable to consumers. That, that might not always be the case, but I think for a long time, whether it's the next five years or 10 years, like I think just you know, a little bit of the newness and the, you know, because of where the industry's at and, you know, the history, like, I I think that just that aspect of, hey, I can be at a festival and interact with a zigzag who I've known for years or interact with the high times who I've known for years or interact with a new company like Stills or Traditional or Trees or Sunday School or something like that. Like that's all really, you know, valuable right now for consumers. So, you know, that doesn't mean that we stop there and don't try and make it a created integrated offering. Right. Like we've always tried to sort of, you know, take these brands and sort of morph them into, you know, something that resembles some sort of creative slant. So at Grasslands, it's kind of been like a town, right? You know, we try and fit, make an edible brand feel like a bakery. We try and make, you know, a flower brand feel like a greenhouse experience, right? We're always trying to sort of make sure we did a lot of things with like terpenes, right? You know, we have a smell wall thing there where you can actually sort of identify the different p- profiles of terpenes. And so, and then the other piece that's really interesting, uh, and this is going to be no surprise to anybody, is that one of the things that really goes off there is the interactive art. Right. So we have a bunch of art murals and spots where allow people, we start with some basic designs, but we allow people in our consumption areas to actually paint and create and decorate and help evolve this, you know, these art walls that we have. And as you'd imagine, the participation is like off the chart from that because, you know, you're, you're there, you're, you know, consuming a little bit, you're getting into that creative mindset and here's a bunch of things that you can do instantly to participate and and contribute. And so, you know, it's really that sense of creating, you know, this sort of all this world of cannabis there that's really people have really dug and it really fits within the mode of of the festival because you know again we have these other worlds where you can go and have a deep wine experience you can go have a deep beer experience you can go have a deep food experience you you can come here and and do that but almost all of it is powered by the brands and what we find brands telling us is that just this opportunity to connect with these types of consumers 
in a, in a really direct, impersonal way means that they're building relationships for their brand. And, and those generally extend outside of that. In other words, the people that come there generally become evangelists, become people who feel really connected to those brands in a deeper way than if you're just, you know, at, at a, you know, somewhere handing out a flyer or doing a sampling or a discount or something like that. The, the experience of outside lands kind of, you know, we feel kind of helps cultivate that deeper connection. Yeah, I remember the first time I went to Grasslands, I was like running around, I got my face painted, I got a picture with Ranger Dave and Ranger Ruth at the uh, Sunday Goods like flower truck, I got like a scoop of candy at the Kiva booth <laughs> at the Kiva candy shop. It was, it was adult summer camp. It was so fun. It's overlooking the music festival in a way because it's up in the trees. So it's it's really fun to be an adult and be able to go have that kind of a creative and immersive experience for sure. I mean, it's so cool. Obviously, Superfly, you you guys do things very different than most. What is the the blocker from other festivals doing something cool like this? You know, in a market like California, you've got plenty of big festivals, festivals like Coachella, which have essentially zero presence when it comes to cannabis. And even outside the state of California, I mean, there are so many states now with adult use cannabis legalized it's pretty surprising that you don't hear about more kind of events that have some cannabis representation and maybe not at the level of experience that, you know, your work with grasslands does, but something, you know, just some presence. I'm just really surprised. Is it, was it really hard working with the state? Are people just not thinking about it kind of going through the motions of just, this is how we've always done it and not exploring new things. Is it something else? I think it's a little deeper than that. And, you know, I can't say that I'm like all uh, knowing expert on this. So, you know, what I'm about to say may not encompass everybody out there or every situation, but I think there's two sort of big factors. One is the laws, right? In each particular municipality, because it really gets down to, you know, our municipalities licensing consumption and sales at special events. Right. That's a very particular type of license that you need to get. And, you know, just to do a special event, right, you have to go through a particular licensing process that's outside of the normal sphere of things, you know, to get a temporary liquor license, for instance, license for a, you know, non brick and mortar, you know, space is a particular process. And some municipalities have set that up for cannabis and most probably haven't, right? It's still too early for them or, you know, you know, the, the wheels of justice uh, are, are moving slowly in that direction, right? So that's the first factor is, you know, and I know, for instance, in Colorado, I believe they don't have any, you know, consumption laws on the books. I don't think, and I could be wrong about this. I, I did a festival in Colorado a bunch of years ago and we looked into this. Things might have changed since then. But my understanding is throughout Colorado, you can't, there's no licensed consumption area, you know, whether it's a permanent or temporary venue period. So, you know, just, it's really just not, a, the laws have not, you know, allowed for this kind of thing to happen. The second factor may be that the organization that is running the events itself, maybe is just not ready for that, right? We're lucky we're an independent business. We generally do business with other smaller independent businesses, but from time to time, we will be do we do business with the bigger, you know, multinational, larger corporations that are in our space, and you know they have you know probably more reticence, you know, towards something like this for lots of reasons that exist, you know, in in their business realities. So you know, I think it's a combination. It's 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 really the laws plus you know, whether the, the producing party is really you know, in the position to sort of pioneer in this in this way. You know, we, we are fortunate that the city of San Francisco um, was very thoughtful in this regard. And really, you know, frankly, you know, both the state and the city officials wanted to see if they could use outside lands as a place to sort of test this out and see if they can, you know, get this right with us a bit as a guinea pig. And we were interested in meeting that challenge with them because um, we want to be pioneers here. We want to create, you know, do this in the proper, safe, you know, viable way. And we felt like because we have, you know, such great working relationships on the, on all these different levels, state and city and all the different various departments, you know, the Office of Cannabis, the, the you know, health departments, like we were just so you know, used to working collaboratively with them. And many of the people on the outside lands team have been doing this for many, many decades and to have deep relationships. And we thought, look, 
because of what outside lands is, you know, this expression of Bay Area culture, because cannabis industry is based here, we should be supporting that industry. We should be giving that industry the biggest platform and we should be the ones that work with, you know, the powers that be to do that in the right way and to, to be a model for other things uh, beyond us. Um, we felt that that was an opportunity and a responsibility for us with our mission. And, you know, it's, it seems to have, uh, you know, been, been a good thing for everybody in that regard. Yeah, it's great. It does make a lot of sense. The regulatory framework, you know, more and more areas are getting on premise consumption laws changed, but it's been a long, slow rollout. Like I think in Colorado, maybe Denver now has some stuff just possibly. And uh, like, we're just talking about like Las Vegas is getting on premise consumption, but they're also probably very restrictive for the type of location, right? And probably not broad rules that'll allow this type of thing. So I can see how, yeah, very much it's a like a regulatory problem. And hopefully with more and more on-premise consumption, you know, th- these things will change over time. You know, right now, you know, certainly the, the state mandates that it, it's separate, right? That, that grasslands has to be separate from like the rest of the festival. You can't just buy cannabis inside the main festival area or right next to the beer tent or at the beer tent, right? It's a, it's a separate you know, kind of, um, I guess, activation for, for lack of a better, better term there. Do you, do you think that would change too? Is that like something that we may see legislation kind of come into play where it loosens up over time and we're just kind of cracking the door open with something like this? Like, I think, I think there always will be a, a use case, uh, for a grasslands type situation where you have, you know, an experiential place to go to learn about this stuff, to do art and just kind of maybe get away from, from certain parts of the festival. But I also see a world where it could be more tightly integrated into the festival itself. But, you know, that world may be, you know, far away, just depending on, you know, regulatory restrictions. Yeah. Well, it's certainly our hope. Uh, I would say that. And in a lot of ways from our years of experience, we actually think it's probably the healthiest and the most, you know, effective way to do things. Like we've always thought that, for instance, beer gardens create the dynamic where people drink more quickly, not more leisurely, right? And so we actually think that beer gardens kind of, you know, can have actually a negative effect on, you know, responsible consumption. And I would say, you know, probably similar, you know, to cannabis, right? But you know, at the same time, like, look, we understand that this is really new, that, you know, the powers that be have a responsibility to move, you know, thoughtfully and slowly through these processes. And, you know, that we're asking a lot of them, right, just to put their resources and energy into, you know, licensing a, a one weekend event, which, you know, it, it should be not lost on anybody, the amount of energy it takes from all parties to manifest something like that and from, you know, government to, to, do their thing and making sure that it's done, you know, within, in their purview and and done safely and thoughtfully. And so, you know, I, I do think that ultimately as, as we do this right and we do it in a way that, you know, um, you know, shows people that it can be done safely and, you know, with, with good benefit for everybody that, you know, they'll become, you know, those type of conversations that says, okay, how do we do this better? How do we, you know, evolve this more into being something, uh, that looks like other, you know, aspects of consumption uh, at, at a public event. And so I think that's the key here is just like, you know, every, everybody needs to like all aspects of the industry, patience and long-term vision and, you know, comporting yourself and your finances and everything you do with that in mind. And that's not always easy, but that's certainly our mindset. And um, I do think that like, it's one of the reasons we felt so strongly that outside land should be a pioneer here because we have the biggest platform in the city in, t- in terms of a, you know, large scale outdoor music event event and we know that we're going to do it in the right way right we're going to work with you know all the authorities uh, to to do it in a way that proves that we can do this right right the last thing we want is somebody who's not as maybe experienced or you know thoughtful as us doing it wrong right and so we just felt like hey let's take that leadership and do it and prove to people that you know it can be done you know, right. And I, we hope that we can continue to lead in the same regard that we become a place that continues to, you know, 
be somewhere where government feels comfortable, you know, evolving uh, how it's done to, to find that exact right place. So speaking of kind of where it is now and heading into the future, curious to hear what you're working on next. Like what it, what's the future of events? What are some of the interesting cross sections you're seeing with cannabis and, and these, some of these like Web3, NFT, yeah, other events that are going on? How are you viewing this on the go forward? I mean, we look at it from all aspects of our business, right? First off, how can it further integrate in our large scale events that we do? How can it evolve into even location based experiences that we're doing? And, you know, how can we be of service to the industry who's looking to, you know, creatively market towards their consumers? And, you know, we always are interested in engaging with cannabis companies. I feel like there's an opportunity you know, to do things uniquely in their marketing mix and, and have the funds to do so. You know, where we always sort of look for what's next and how things are evolving is typically around trends in media and technology. So if you look at the last like two decades of how experiences have evolved, they generally track to some trend in uh, entertainment at large or technology at large. And, you know, we saw that, for instance, when we birthed Bonnaroo, it was at the same time as digital music was coming online and internet communication was coming online, right? And that really changed what people's expectations of a music experience was. If you get, have the all you can eat buffet of digital music, you would naturally want to go to an event that wasn't one or two artists, but that was maybe 50 or a hundred artists, right? That same sort of sampling. And, you know, as social media started to evolve, um, particularly into visual social media, you saw this huge increase in experiences that could be, you know, transferred to social media that could kind of create that, you know, uh, perception of who I am as an individual, because I'm creating content for my following or for my friends and the people that, you know, I'm interacting with on social media that created a little bit of a FOMO thing, which again, meant that experience sort of needed to evolve to, you know, create more of those types of moments where, you know, you could share the experience in a meaningful way. And I'd say, you know, the last a bunch of years, you know, really the last decade, but becoming more acute over the last four or five years is really, you know, around gaming and gaming has started to create much more of a sense of people having some agency and even to a degree, some ownership over their experience, right? When you play and get vested, really vested in a video game, you're building relationships and community with other people playing that game. You are navigating that game in a way that's sort of your choice in a lot of ways. And, you know, you're, you're building up typically some digital assets that are, have value for you in that game experience. And so, you know, that being the case, we're seeing a lot of that poured over into experience. People want more agency. They want to have relationships and build community, you know, around that typically digitally first, where they're meeting people who they might go to that experience with, but they didn't meet, you know, in person, they met digitally. And so they had this opportunity to go do something together and where there's some level of digital ownership. And this is where kind of the web three and the NFT world comes in, right? Is and NFTs essentially are a tool for digital ownership, for true digital ownership. Ownership around these digital products allows people to sort of organize around communities, right, that, that share the ownership in that digital product. And through that, look to create a community. And, you know, vis-a-vis -vis that, what we're seeing is a desire among those communities to have experiences, real world experiences. And so we're starting, you know, a bunch of different things that kind of help support that. We actually launched a new business line at Superfly called Super NFT. And that business is really the intent of that business is to help Web3 communities create meaningful in real life experiences. We launched a, a platform called Super Fest, which is essentially the idea of crowd creating a festival. So rather than doing what I typically do, which is come up with all of the who, what, where, when, and why, and how, and all that kind of stuff, and then find an audience for it, we're actually starting with an audience of people who want to 
create a festival together. We're starting with a community of artists who want to interact with that community to create a festival. And we as producers are going to take a lot of our cues on what that experience becomes and what that community becomes based on what the consumer wants. So kind of reverse engineering sort of how you create an experience and how you create a community that is engaged and cares about that experience. And you're seeing some similar things in, in cannabis too, right? There's a project called Cream. It's uh, based in New York that is, you know, kind of trying to tie in sort of the relationship that people typically have with dispensaries and products in, in a way that, um, you know, creates, a, you know, community around that. And there's another project that's, you know, pretty new called Flowers that's put on by the Green Street folks that also similarly is looking to sort of, you know, think about how the relationship between your cannabis experience, between strains, between the heritage of that stuff and how that kind of ties together with community as well. And so, you know, these new modalities of people organizing and uh, communing, uh, I think are generally where you see really amazing, you know, progressive things happening. You know, what I really like about this phase right now of where this intersection with technology and, and experience is happening is it's really about so much of about is building deeper and more, you know, vested communities. Right. And I think that when people come together for the purpose of uh, engaging with arts and entertainment and making friendships and relationships, really great stuff happens. And, you know, the value of our events has always been really about the experience that people have. It hasn't really been about the content itself. Right. I mean, that's valuable. Sure. Going to see a show and getting blown away by an artist or, you know, having a piece of food that's opened your mind or, you know, experiencing a new uh, beverage or a new cannabis product. You know, that's awesome. But really what it's about and really what you remember coming out of these things is like the feelings that you had around it, the people that you were with, what it what it kind of meant to you and your life as, uh, you know, a, a moment. And so I think that's, you know, what's really cool about, you know, the, the moment now is that this technology, these things that are enabling communities to come together in new ways are just propagating more opportunities for people to feel, you know, like, hey, I'm, I'm doing something meaningful as I'm engaging with art, as I'm engaging with the commerce around it. It's it's not merely transactional. It's it's deeper than that. It's about forming community and propagating community. And, you know, that's what, that's what I love to do. And um, ho hopefully, uh, you know, we're, we're just getting going and doing more of that uh, within these new frameworks. Yeah, absolutely. Well said. And I think uh, community is, is the common thread here. And uh, I think as grasslands, you know, as part of outside land show that these things don't need to be mutually exclusive, right? Music festivals and cannabis or digital experiences and music, like it's all just kind of part of, of this you know, overall community and, and ways to facilitate that is a really powerful thing. So where can uh, everyone learn more about everything that you've got going on at Superfly? Well, you can always go to the Superfly, you know, LinkedIn or Twitter uh, feeds because they tend to have kind of all the content aggregated in one place. You know, go to the Outside Lands website, sfoutsidelands.com, and you can find all the information about uh, grasslands on there. Um, I think there's also a Grasslands Instagram handle too. Uh, it's that's easy to find. And then you know for Superfest, same thing. Go to Twitter. The Superfest is spelled with a three instead of the e in in fest. So it's S U P E R F three S T as a sort of nod to Web three. The Superfest website is uh, same thing. Superfest S U P E R F three S T dot X Y Z. So plenty of information in all of those places. Fantastic. Well, Rick, thanks so much for joining us. Hey, thanks for having us. Thanks for listening to the High Rise Podcast, presented by Headset. For more information on Headset, visit headset.io.